real treat tonight. We did uh, uh, something very similar to this at the Valley Campus. I'm Dan, by the way, if you don't know me. I just I take it for granted. Um, my wife, Cassandra, and I have been around Relate for nine odd years. Yeah, I know, isn't that crazy? Um, feels like yesterday. And we're the pastors of a campus that you might not know we have in, in Abbotsford. We meet on um, the campus of UFV. It's wonderful, it's a ton of fun. You should come and join us, 10 a.m. on a Sunday. Um, but don't neglect your, your service here. Liz, you just have to book it off wherever you are. We've talked about this, that's awesome. We did something really similar to this, and um, we did five speakers, and I'm telling you, by the time we reached five, the pump was just primed, and it, I, I was bawling. It was just, I was done, I was over. Um, there's so much power in a story. There's so much power in somebody coming up here and testifying of the goodness of God and what he's done in their lives. If I have one encouragement for you today, and then we're gonna get, bring up our, our very own Madison Dole, I'm so excited. Um, uh, Picture yourself up here with a microphone in your hand, staring at all of you fr uh, friendly people, and then, and then make sure you look friendly, okay? It, don't be afraid to clap once in a while. Don't be afraid to say, yeah, that's good. It is, it is, it is scary up here once in a while. So uh, please, let's offer some encouragement to our speakers as they step out in faith, as they step out to share what God's put on their hearts. Let's be a church that hollers back once in a while. Can we do that? Let's start right now. We've got Madison Dole coming on up. Hello. Um, so I'm Maddie. Um, I obviously have grown up in a Christian home. My mother is right there. My father's at the back making sure I sound wonderful. Thank you. Um, my grandparents are in Paris, which I did not know until they posted it on Instagram. That's just my life. Um, I am a creative. I like painting and writing. Um, I love kids. I do kids out at Valley. Yeah, you do. They're my favorite. <laughs> Sorry, the Surrey kids are no longer my favorite. The Valley ones are. Um, yeah, it's true. Not that I pick favorites. Um, so today, I'm going to tell a little bit about my story. But first off, I'm going to pray quickly. So if you could bow your heads with me. Um, thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you for bringing us all here. Um, I pray that every single one of the words that comes out of our speaker's mouths is from you, and this is all for your glory and not for ours, Lord God. Um, I pray that it doesn't land on deaf ears either, that all of these people hear something that they need to hear today, because you are speaking to them directly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so when I was a kid, I had a lot of super irrational fears. Um, I was afraid of scorpions, still am. I was afraid of fire, that's gotten slightly better. Um, I was afraid of public speaking, still not my favorite, sorry. Um, I was afraid of speaking of any kind because I, if I got excited, I would trip up of my words and get the wrong words out, and that's not my favorite thing to do. Um, but even at like a young age, if you asked me what my biggest fear was, I'd answer being lonely or ending up alone which some people would be like, well, that's a lot for like a 10 year old. <laughs> um, but I perceived myself as being distinctly different than other kids. I was always the tallest in my class. I was always the back row middle in every class photo. Um, I was usually a bit bigger than all of my friends and I was pretty shy. And those insecurities only snowballed into my teen years. Um, so my family is great. This is, I love, I love you. But um, I craved love and attention from people outside my family because the enemy was whispering in my ear telling me that they had no choice and they had to love me. Um, so I craved people who chose to love me. And that ended up in, with some sketchy friendships. But at 16, I ended up in a relationship that completely pivoted my very being. Um, I ended up in a relationship was someone who I thought was ra or lavishing me in the love that I craved, but I didn't fully comprehend until the last two years that that relationship is certainly qualified as emotionally and psychologically abusive. Um, it f felt like I was being loved and adored, but I was only being used. Um, he ended up disappearing for a long period of time, which tore my fragile heart apart because I had wrapped my world around him. And then he reappeared and told me that he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And in my naivety, I believed him. And he used this death sentence to mess with my head. And then he disappeared again. 
And I happen to know this person's still alive. <laughs> so that's why I know that's a lie. Um, but all I wanted was to be loved. And I was so broken in that moment. The enemy told me I wasn't worthy of the love that I was seeking. So I slipped into a deep depression and I dealt with self-harm and suicidal thoughts. Um, but God stepped in when I had hit my rockiest bottom. Um, as a teenager, I remember there was like a week straight um, where I was waking up at 6.33 in the morning, every morning. And for someone who's A, a teenager, and B, dealing with depression, waking up at 6.33 is not my cup of tea. Um, so I was like, why? Why is this happening? And then finally I heard God whisper to me to open my Bible. My Bible fell open to Matthew 6.33 which says, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. So I'm so thankful that that person is no longer in my life, but God knew through the whole thing, he saw me and he brought me out of that situation. Psychologically, I still deal with a lot of repercussions. Um, I've gone to therapy to work through PTSD and anxiety, but I seek God first in the moments where I feel it all coming back. And it's not always easy, and in fact, it rarely is, but it's so worth it. Psalm 84:11 says, For the Lord God is brighter than the brilliance of the sunrise. Wrapping himself around me like a shield, he's so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. Those who walk along his paths with integrity never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all. So God knows what each one of us needs. He knows, that the, pe he knows the people that need to be in our lives. So I'm not afraid of ending up alone anymore because I know God is going to give me the people that need to hear me. I was so, I used to be so afraid and ashamed of this season in my life. And in that fear and shame, the enemy kept me small. For six long years, I never told a soul because a voice was whispering in my ear saying that no one would believe me or if I say it anything, I'd lose my friends or the love that I had worked so hard to gain. So most days I just sit petrified in my room but God would step in again, and he placed people in my life that were safe. He gave me an opportunity to tell the truth, and the more I did, the less hold that shame had on me. So, like, if you're here today and you have one of those, like a big thing that you feel like no one can know or else you're not gonna feel love, God loves you. God knows who you need in your life. You just have to ask him. So, thank you. Hey guys, so I just want to start off actually by saying a quick thank you first to Pastors Angela and Rod because well, like first for this opportunity to share with you all tonight but also because thinking and prepping for this message, um, it's actually been a year now since I moved out here to Vancouver and started calling Relate Home. It was actually the 14th was the one year mark and these two have just been such a great example of what it means to be leaders who actually just go out of their way to make people feel welcome and belong. So you guys have been a massive part of my story. So I'm so grateful for both of you. And now for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anthony and I work as a barista. I'm at JJ Bean currently, but I've been doing barista stuff for about four years now, give or take. And to be honest, I absolutely love my job. It's one of those jobs I get to just hang around with people, connect with people, chat with them all day, and help them feel like they belong, like they're valued for who they are. But the truth is, it hasn't always been my favorite part of the job. When I started working as a barista, I absolutely hated that part of the job because I was terrified to show up to work because I didn't know if I could talk to people all day. Um, and it's funny now looking back on it, but the thing is, what most people don't know about me is I used to struggle a lot with actually just feeling like I don't belong and wondering if people would accept me for who I am and wondering just where my place was in life and what I was here for. And to be honest, that was with having a loving family and really good friends around me through the whole journey and it just comes out of nowhere sometimes. Um, and I could tell you a number of stories about how God's just been absolutely faithful in my life to help bring me on this journey to understanding what belonging means. 
But I want to share with you actually my favorite story, and that's the Word of God, because it's really when I started getting into the Word of God more that I started understanding what it means to belong. And I want to share with you today about a parable from, it's in the Gospel of Luke. It's the parable of a great banquet, and who's being invited to this wedding feast. But before I do, I actually want to give you a little bit of backstory. So the Bible is a book about belonging. It's like the essence is what it means to belong, and specifically to the people of God. So back in the Old Testament, what that means to belong is actually God delivered this actual group of people called Israel. He took them out of exile in Egypt and brought them over. And at Mount Sinai, they made a covenant. Now, this covenant was just a terms of agreement, what this relationship would actually look like. And it included blessings if they were obedient. It included some consequences if they weren't. And for those of you who haven't read the whole thing, a bit of a spoiler alert, they weren't obedient. <laughs> they, they ended up in exile. But the thing is, God was faithful through that. And he actually, he sent prophets, and what the prophets were there for is to remind them of this covenant, this agreement they made with God. And it was through this agreement that the prophets were trying to remind them of this so they could get back in right standing with God. And so when Jesus came, he was actually taking on this role of prophet, and he wanted to bring this challenge to make, just challenge the Israelites, challenge the people who were so sure of their belonging to just let them know what they actually needed. Um, yeah, anyways, let's get into the passage here. So Luke 14, verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now that's what this whole passage is about. Who's going to be at this feast? Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. <laughs> the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became very angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets, alleys of the town, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told the servant, go out to the roads, the country lanes, and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So what's Jesus doing here? Well, firstly, what he's not doing is he's not telling those who made the excuses that they don't belong. That's the furthest thing from his mind. But what he is doing is he's challenging what they think to be true. And he was talking to prominent leaders in this community. And what he wanted them to know is that just because you think you belong, this isn't actually the case. You still need to show up. And the thing is, that's not the amazing part of this story. The amazing part is that he said the people who did show up are the ones who are poor, lame, the crippled, the blind. Now these people were on the fringes of society. They were excluded. They were not getting invited to events like this. And you can most certainly bet that they did not feel like they belong there, but they showed up. And so now I think there's two groups of people here just in the last couple minutes we've got. And this rings true for us. So the first group of people is those of us who, we've been coming here, we've been doing this life in church for a while. God's brought us on this journey already to understanding what it means to belong. And the thing is, for us, this challenge, it applies to us. We need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to show up? And that's gonna look different for everyone in here. Because God's bringing you on your own journey. But if you're unsure of where that is, a good place to start is going to be helping others feel like they belong. Because you can't go wrong with that. If you're doing that, you're doing enough. And the second group of people I want to address is those who might feel more like the second group in the parable. 
like the poor, the crippled, the lame, those who just are unsure of their place here, who maybe you're new here, or maybe you've been coming here for years, maybe 10 years even, and you just aren't quite sure what your place is in this family. And I want to tell you that the good news of the gospel and of this parable is that you've got an invitation. The messenger came, he gave you an invitation, so therefore you belong. That's a, that's a power of an invitation. It has absolutely nothing to do with you. Not how good you are, not what you can bring, not what you can contribute. It's simply, you have it, so you belong. And so if I can leave you with one thought, there's nothing that I can tell you, there's nothing the person beside you can tell you, and most importantly, there's nothing that you can tell yourself. And I want to repeat that, because I think so often we disqualify ourselves there is absolutely nothing you can tell yourself to disqualify yourself from belonging. You have an invitation, so please come. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, you know when you're about to go on stage and your heart is just really pounding and you have to pee? I won't. Um, my name is Liz. <laughs> my name is Liz. Uh, I'm married to Callum over there. And we have a baby named Isla. She's 15 months. And people who aren't parents are like, 15 months? That's such a dumb number. She's one in a bit if you don't have a child. <laughs> um, and life gets crazy sometimes. And we don't, sometimes we go through all these things and you don't even realize how you got to where I am. I am married. We have our 10-year high school reunion coming up. We're selling a home, I have a mortgage, when did this happen? Um, so when life gets so crazy, I am so grateful for this word, this Bible, this thing, that when I'm starting to be like, who even am I? Am I a housewife of Wally? Or am I, you know, like, who am I? Um, so I'm so grateful for this word, so why don't we just get right into it? I'm going to read us a story in Luke 19 about a man named Zacchaeus. So, uh, Luke 19 says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short, I feel you, to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came that way, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come quick down. I must be your guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be with the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. Awesome. I love this story. So relate. Um, but Zacchaeus, he was actually born Judean. So he was born in Judea. He was, he was a resident there. This is where he lived. And at the time, the Roman Empire were the one in charge of taxes, and they thought of this really cool idea to hire locals to take the taxes instead of getting Romans to come in. So Zacchaeus decided to sign up, get a job, and he worked his way up to chief collector, and essentially he got rich taking money off of his neighbors and his colleagues and his peers and his friends. 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 So whenever I'm rich, which is never, <laughs> but whenever I feel rich, I am so chill. Like I'm like, ah, oh, man, there's like good hundy in my account right now. <laughs> Things feel great. Life is excellent. But you look at Zacchaeus here, and you look, he is, he's got it all. He's super rich. He's got all the things. And then you see in verse 3, it says, um, where is it? He tried to get a good look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So instead, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. If you are short, climbing is hard, and it's not easy. And imagine Zacchaeus feels he's rich. He has all he needs. He's got a good job. He has security. Imagine he has all the benefits or whatever. But he knows. He's heard of this Jesus coming in, and he's so desperate 
for something. It's like when you, you know you should be doing something, but you don't know how, and your heart's just pounding, and so he does whatever he can. In such an urgent way, he runs across the street. There are probably a huge amount of crowds there, and he's little, but when you are small, you can weave your way. But he's crowding, and he's, and whatever, and he finds this tree, and he, like, he's climbing the tree to even get a glimpse of this man that, is speak, that he's heard is speaking of a new life and of forgiveness. And after all of that, after he climbs, probably sweating, probably panting, probably looking for him, in that moment, the most famous man at the time looks at him in the eye and calls him by his name. And I could imagine, at this time, Zacchaeus would have been known as a bit of a sellout to his friends, to his peers in his town, I'm sure no one really wanted to be around him. I mean, the reaction he has to when Jesus calls his name, it makes me think that maybe he hadn't heard his name said in such a way of love and content in a long time. I mean, what would you call somebody who stole from you? You don't have to say it out loud because it's probably not appropriate. <laughs> but what would you call someone? So he hasn't heard his name spoken in a way of welcoming in a long time. But Jesus calls him by his name, and even more, he chose Zacchaeus to hang out with, to spend dinner with, to chill with, to talk over dinner and go to his house. And I feel like we can be just like this sometimes. We work hard and we hustle and we strive so hard to achieve something to get to where we think we should be because that's what we thought all along. And you get there and it happens and you still crave more. Or maybe, You've compromised everything that you thought you should be. You've compromised the life that you know that you should be living by. But things have happened, situations have happened. Things changed, and now you feel like you've compromised too many times and you're too far gone. And those things can make us feel so isolated and so alone, and then you feel wrong, and then you feel guilty, and then you feel isolated because you feel guilty, and then you feel alone because you're isolated and guilty. There's a cycle. But like Zacchaeus, when we we decide, we put ourselves in a position where we can see Jesus for who he is and we can we get, and get a glimpse of who we are in him. So when we position ourselves and in that place, and Zacchaeus had to work hard sometimes, it can, your journey to get there sometimes isn't easy. He had to climb a tree, he ran. Whatever your journey was, we have to go out of our own way sometimes to see Jesus for who he is. We are the ones that have to position ourselves to get there. But when we do, Jesus immediately looks us in the face and just calls us by our name and tells us that he has chosen to be with us. And it just reminds me of the prodigal son in that moment where he comes back and Jesus is, or the father is so far away, like still like a, a dot down the driveway. And the moment that we can even get a glimpse of him, the father is running and as fast as he could, not just like a casual jog that I'm used to, but like really, really, really fast. And he comes and he welcomes him and he's ready to welcome you in your arms wholeheartedly, just like a huge hug. And it's there, it's there in that presence of Jesus. It's there when you see who he is, when your heart is changed. So if we go back to verse eight. It says, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I'll give half of my wealth to the poor Lord. And if I've cheated, I'll give it all back. And that's what happens when you realize who you are in God. That's what happens when you see who Jesus is. Your heart starts to change. And it's like the song, it says, your love's too good to leave me here. There's so much grace for us. There's so much grace for all the things we've done wrong and all the things that we promised God, but it didn't go through. And and the things that we've done that we're ashamed of. There's so much grace for that. And God accepts us where we are. But in that presence of Jesus is when our heart starts to change for the, for the 100% better. But Jesus accepted him and wanted to spend time with Zacchaeus before he even said those words. Before Zacchaeus promised anything, Jesus wanted to be with him. The moment we make the decision to see Jesus for who he is is the time when we belong. Jesus doesn't actually, he doesn't wait for you to get your act together, thank God. Because he knows that could take a while. The moment that we position ourselves to see Jesus, a glimpse of who he is, we belong. You as you are, at this current point in your life, you belong. You belong here at church. We love you here at church. It doesn't matter 
your job, it doesn't matter what you did last night, it doesn't matter. You belong here, we welcome you. Your past, we welcome you. Just like the person next to you, we all belong here. And it's not because of the promises that we made to do better, to be better. We belong because of who we belong to. Yeah. So good. Can we give it up for all of our speakers one more time? Amazing. Amazing. Mia's going to play the keys behind me, and we're just going to wrap up service in a minute here. That was powerful. There's a lot of, of wisdom. There's a lot of gold in there. We can do this again at some point. You never know if uh, you might be the lucky one picked out of the crowd. Get ready. Um, Anthony, you said something. You're, you're in here somewhere. There you are. He said something I love so much. He said, so often we're the ones who disqualify ourselves. We're the ones who, who look at our own situations and say, not good enough. There's a lot of factors out there, I understand. There's a lot of voices that speak into our lives. But so often I think it comes back, maybe we're pulling on an old identity, something someone said to us one time, but it comes back to just that. It's like, I'm in the, I'm in the moment. Do I reach out? Do I, do I say yes? Do I take the step that God's calling me to? But no, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I haven't got it figured out. I've screwed up. I've messed up. I've sinned. I've fallen short. I just think there's something powerful in the knowledge that you can't disqualify yourself because you never qualified yourself. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't do the work. You're not a self-made man, self-made woman. I don't care. You're a child of God. He, he created you, and he bought you back. You're his twice over. You're not disqualified because he qualifies you, and nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing can pull you apart. I'm just going to go back to my daughter over and over, but she's not qualified for the love of her father because of anything she did, and she could never disqualify herself from it. But we, um, we've been potty training or trying. We're not doing it well. Um, Matt's has heard this story, but as we've been trying this, she's great at number ones, guys. She's just awesome at it. She's super, she's super solid. She's like, daddy pee pee, and we're like, yeah, potty, we're going. And we usually make it. Um, number twos have been an issue. They've been, they haven't been going well. She doesn't love it. She'll poop on the potty if she is wearing a diaper, but not if she's not, which really defeats the purpose. But um, we noticed something in the process. And we're, we're, we're first-time parents, and we use all this silly little language that you all hate, but you're just not parents. And if you are a parent, you're like, yeah, no, I get it. Um, we use words like boop-boo, boop-boo, boop-boo. And uh, we noticed after a while that Ray, who's very clingy, she loves being around us. She's clingy is the wrong word, but she's affectionate and loving and, and loves her parents. But she started disappearing for bits of time, and we'd be like, where the heck is our daughter? She's like a tag-along. She's literally always with us. Started disappearing in our home. And we, we would find her, and like she's got this dollhouse that Grandma and Grandpa bought her, and we'd see her like crouching behind the dollhouse, peeking through the window at us, and we realized that she was hiding when she needed to poop. She was hiding. She was, she was, she was ashamed, in a way. We had made something of this that it wasn't. She was, she was covering up in this moment of insecurity and weakness. And we had to explain to her, as we realized, shoot, we've done a bad job. We've been like, did you do a stinky poo-poo? And she's like, yes. And she's associating this as like, oh no, what did I do? We had to explain to her one day, we're like, hey, Ray, Ray, just so you know, like, hey, everybody poo-poos. <laughs> everybody poo-poos. And, and there's this look of amazement in her eyes as she realizes, everybody poo-poos? And I'm like, yeah, everybody. She's like, daddy poo-poo? I'm like, yeah, dad, yeah, for sure. Mom, mama poo-poo? And you're like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Don't tell Cassandra I'm telling you this. And she started realizing, I think, in that moment that I'm not alone. I'm not the only one ashamed, the only one with crap. It, it, it gets worse because she goes to grandma and grandpa's and she just straight up asks, like, grandma poo poo? Grandpa poo poo? And she gets like progressively higher as she goes in the, in the stage. And we're like, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And she comes to kids ministry one day at church and Maddie's there and she's like, Maddie? And I'm like, we're not going to talk about that. Like, that's it's between you and Maddie. But I think there's a lot of power in the realization, church. If you're in the room tonight and you've disqualified yourself, I just tell you that everybody poo-poos. 
The Bible says that we've all fallen short of God's glory, that we've missed the mark, that no matter how your performance and how holy you've been and how you haven't done that this week, so I'm on a good streak, I belong in the present. No, no, you belong because of, of him who qualified you, not you who qualified you. But this is important because, because the Bible does say it. Says, All have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. The word is an archery term that means to miss the mark. You might not have missed it by that far. You might think, I'm a good person. But we've missed the mark. There's, a, there's an inherent gap between my humanness and his holiness. But there's a way. I think people get hung up on Christianity sometimes because we preach exclusivity. We say, there's only one way to God. But you're, you're bearing the lead. There's a way to God. There's a way to God. He offers us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And every Sunday here at church, we're gonna offer people an invitation to say yes to that bridge, to the gap filler, to understand the realization that, yeah, I'm not perfect and I might have messed up and I don't know what you did last night or earlier today, but we've all fallen short and God's made a way for us. So here in this place right now, we're just gonna give people in the room an opportunity to say, I know that I'm not perfect, but there's a God who loves you, your whole heart, every little piece of you, and loves you enough to take you on a journey with him to becoming more like him, a journey of love. The end of that journey is love. So tonight, if that's you in the room, we're going to close our eyes, we're going to bow our heads. I just want to encourage you. There's a God out there who's pursuing you, who's chasing after your heart who so desires relationship with you, intimacy with you. The, the, the goal here is to know God, not, not like head knowledge, not like I know stuff about God, not like I've read my Bible front to back many times, no, to intimately understand the love of the Father towards his children. That no matter what, you are loved, you are valued, and you belong because you've been adopted into his family. So that's you in the room tonight. I'm going to come to three, and all we'll ask is that you put your hand up. We're not going to get you to come to the front. We're not going to get you to stand up. It's really for your benefit more than ours. It's an outward show of something happening on the inside. It's so you can walk out these doors tonight and say, no, I made a decision. But that's you. One, can I just tell you, God loves you deeply, intimately. You are his child. He is madly in love with you, too. Nothing you have done and nothing you will do can separate you from that love. Three, if you're in the room tonight, you want to say yes to Jesus, just put your hand up. Yeah, I see that hand. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. The Bible says that all you need to do to be saved, to be welcome into this relationship is to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Lord means not only Father, but, but there's, a, there's an aspect of ownership to it. There's a part that says, I am not my own. I was bought with a price, so I'm going to give myself to you. And I'm going to, in return, take up the life that Jesus has for you. So in this moment, we're not going to say a fancy prayer, but my encouragement to you would just be to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, to say even under your breath right now that, Jesus, you're my Lord. I give my life to you. I commit my heart to you. I want to walk with you. And know that with that decision, with the belief and the confession, that, that God was already your father, but now he's in relationship with you. And that relationship will carry you forward in life, and that's so beautiful. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for people in the room making decisions to accept Jesus today. There's power and beauty in that. That's what it's all about.